Warning, this episode is going full speed ahead into spoiler territory for the Magnus Archives. I'm talking about spoiling basically everything in the show here, so if you have any intention of listening to it, which you should if you haven't already, bookmark this page and book it out of here so you can enjoy the series in its true glory. Also, this episode is going to feature in-depth discussions of fear, in particular as they relate to claustrophobia, being buried alive, underground spaces, and debt. As a result, viewer discretion is advised. Oh, and a massive thank you to the Magnus Archives wiki, which was very useful in getting the info for this video together. Hey y'all, I'm Afton G. Kier, and welcome back to Entities Explained, the series where I break down one of 15 entities beyond comprehension from hit horror anthology podcast, The Magnus Archives. We are officially down to the last three, so if this is your first time joining us, well, first off, welcome to the channel, but second, there should now be a playlist in the top right of your screen that'll let you watch this series from its inception. I mean, you don't have to, but it'd be nice. Anyways, subscribe if you don't want to be crushed by a train, and hold on to your ribs because it's time to descend into the buried. Also known as the center, choke, too close, I cannot breathe, and forever deep below creation, the buried is claustrophobia manifest, or in simpler terms, it's the fear of being trapped in small spaces. Most often, these fears manifest in enclosed locations deep beneath the ground, like caves, tunnels, or graves, but not exclusively. Choke can also manifest in deep water, though unlike the vast, forever deep below creation is more focused on water pressure, sinking and drowning. In fact, suffocation is quite common among manifestations of the buried, as a few of its names allude to, which can come in the form of crushing or another common element of choke, dust. Another manifestation of the center not directly tied to the underground is financial burden, as the buried can symbolize the crushing weight of poverty, the feeling of drowning in debt, or the ensnaring force of bad terms borrowing. Oh, I think I forgot to mention that one. Too close I cannot breathe is also symbolic of being trapped in place, or becoming trapped. Also, the in-progress names of the buried are particularly interesting being breathless and close. Yes, apparently Choke was originally meant to be two different entities, even though Johnny can't remember what the difference between them was. I couldn't imagine the buried being separated now. Forever Deep Below creation is weird on a character front. While technically speaking, the buried has quite a few characters, none of them are really significant or, for that matter, appear in more than one episode. That's right, not a single avatar of the buried verifiably appears more than once, which is honestly kind of disappointing. So let's go through all of the center's one-hit wonders. First off, let's start with the one we have the least information about, known only as the man whose teeth were always stained with mud. Mentioned during Annabelle's brief history of the house on Hilltop Road, I would guess that this individual is meant to either be a buried or slaughter avatar who, during a civil war, entombed an agent of the web beneath 105 Hilltop Road. Another fairly insignificant member of Too Close I Cannot Breathe was George Gilbert Scott, who was a student of Robert Smirk that wound up designing buildings that were a little too cozy. While it's unclear if he ever actually became an avatar, or if he just leaned that way, he's at the very least another person impacted. In a similar boat of impacted but probably not a full-blown avatar, we have Enrique McMillan, who after interacting with a very suspicious book, gained a desperate need to dig, stating that he felt comforted by the beneath and overwhelmed by the above. I am a little hesitant to include him on this list, since his patron apparently suffocated him later down the line, but the fact that he could spot a hollow space that, and I quote, all eyes point towards, gives me the sense that he at the very least got some nice abilities out of the deal. I wonder how Jonah felt about being watched back for once. That leads us to the other people who may have been victims or avatars or some combination of the two, like Carolina Gorka who happened to be unfortunate enough to get herself crushed to death in a collapsing train. 
Yeah, the train gradually crushed inwards, but it was only when Gorka laid down on the floor resigned to her fate that it stopped and she found herself in Walthamstow Station, covered in dirt but decidedly alive. What makes her case harder to discern is that after she finished her statement, a great deal of dust was apparently left in the room, which could mean that she's now an avatar, or that the buried isn't done with her yet. Last in our maybe avatar, maybe not section, we have Stefan Brachin, who was drinking mud, always dusty, and had very intense eyes, but presumably died in his episode? Then again, the fact that he kept talking after being dead definitely gives some credence to the idea that he was an avatar. Anyways, moving on to the probably an avatar section, we've got the governor, which, after just posting a video about the mayor, makes me very suspicious indeed. The governor appears for like three paragraphs in Mag 50 Foundations, but what we do see of him is very confusing. He appears as a stocky, short man with a tall hat and an iron-tipped cane, which forms the rhythm of his pace when paired with the jangling of his keys. Apparently, the keys are magic, because those who hear them are struck with the sensation that the walls are closing in around them. It's not the coolest power ever, but it's enough to earn him a place on this list. Another group, or pair of people, I have to mention are Eberhardt and Strauss, the strange organization with a damp office that trapped a man in an overwhelming flood. We don't know much about them, but we do know that their eternal thunderstorm, much like the coffin, can be escaped with the help of an anchor. Oh, and after looking into the names for any hints, Eberhardt seems to just mean brave, but Strauss, it means ostrich. I don't know how this connects, I went searching and all I could find was one of Leitner's assistants named Albert Strauss, but there is no way in hell that a name related to a grounded bird isn't significant. Finally, let's talk about everyone's favorite envious gravedigger, Hezekiah Wakely. Wakely spent the late 1830s working as a sexton for a church, where his favorite duty was digging graves. He would even sometimes spend the night in his freshly dug graves, which eventually led to a grave collapsing on a particularly rainy night, though Hezekiah brushed it off as a dream, since he had apparently survived the ordeal. From there, the addition of safety bells to ruin the peaceful sleep of the dead sent Hezekiah off the deep end, all culminating with him cutting the cord of a ringing bell to get some better rest. Hezekiah Wakely is one of the best inside looks we get at the psychology of an avatar, spread out over several years of transformation and demonstrating just how the mind is warped by powers far beyond its understanding, which I think is a big part of why he's sort of the de facto buried avatar, even though he only appears in one episode and has quite a few ties to the end as well. Oh, he also may have shown up when Gorka was trapped in the underground, since I don't know who else a strange figure with a shovel would be, but it's just as possible that it's not him, since surviving for centuries doing the work of the buried seems antithetical to the whole point of his avatarhood. Guess you just have to take what you can get with this series. Choke has got a number of interesting artifacts, including one that I'll mention at the end, because I'm not sure if it counts as an artifact or a location. Starting off, let's cover the Lightners, one of which is pretty simple, and one of which is not. Dig, mentioned earlier, is the former, being nothing but the word dig written over and over and over again. It slowly corrupts the mind of its reader, driving them to dig at all hours of the day, possibly in pursuit of underground spaces. The other one, called the Seven Lamps of Architecture, is kind of weird. Apparently, if read in full, it brings the walls in around the reader, but if you only read passages of it while near Smirk's architecture, it apparently lets the reader remodel the surrounding area, which is the exact trick Leitner uses to trap the not-them under the Institute. Speaking of Leitner, it is also now apparently coded in his remains, as jovially clarified by Peter Lucas. Moving on from books, the other two items sound very similar in name, but they're vastly different in practice. The box, as you might guess from its name, is an old wooden crate, but you probably don't want to touch it, because if you do, you'll wake up inside of it the next day. 
In the case that you are stupid or unlucky enough to wind up in the box, enjoy a full day of constricting walls that'll feel like way more time than it was, to the point where any watch you bring with you will suddenly be wrong. The other boxy manifestation of the center is the coffin, which is somewhere between a location and an artifact. If that seems confusing, let me explain. Also called the pit, the coffin is in fact a coffin, constructed from unvarnished yellow wood and bound in chains. Those chains come with a key, though the roughly scratched message of do not open on its surface could potentially give you second thoughts about using it. If you're foolish enough to do so, you'll find yourself facing a stairway down, which leads directly to the heart of forever deep below creation. The downward path of stone stairs is compelling drawing people into it before closing the coffin behind them and leaving them with no way out. Only a particularly strong attachment can act as an anchor, which might help someone be led out of the coffin. The coffin throughout its history has apparently acted as a test of willpower, being left with a person and either claiming them or, if they survive for long enough, taking the person who left it as a replacement. However, after an agent of the stranger named John got consumed, the coffin had no one to pass on to, and apparently, because they were somewhere in the vicinity, the pit attached itself to Brecon and Hope, who carted it around until Hope's death, at which point the remaining half left it with the Institute, apparently no longer bound to it on his own. Oh, I forgot to mention the weirdest thing about the coffin. The rain. When it rains, the coffin apparently moans melodically. I don't know how to feel about that one, but there you go. Next up on the docket is locations, and the buried really struck gold with this one, because it is almost entirely about locations. George Gilbert Scott, the aforementioned architect who worked for a time under Smirk before getting kicked out for having no balance, definitely worked on a lot of buildings, with Fishmonger's Hall and an unnamed workhouse being the most notable. The dusty, grimy, collapsing train car of Mag-71 underground should probably be listed here, as should the Kentish Town sewer tunnel, where an unnamed woman was dragged underground by an unseen hand. One location which I think deserves a bit more attention, since it's one of the most infamous episodes of the series, is Lost John's Cave. Part of the Three Counties Cave System, and a real place that you can go visit in Lechfell, Lancashire, Lost John's cave in the Magnus Archives is interesting, to say the least. Varying sizes, plenty of underwater areas, and some pale-handed candle wielders hiding in the darkness mean any trip is an exciting one. Finally, there's Bucota, Washington, which we'll be getting into in the next section. The only ritual we know of for Forever Deep Below creation was called the Sunken Sky, and involved the entire town of Bucota, Washington. On the intersection between River Street and Sixth sat a giant, strangely smooth, spherical pit, which everyone in the town seemed unwilling to recognize in strangeness, and things stayed like that until June 17, 2008, when hell came to Bucota. At two in the morning, the entire town was drawn towards and climbed into the Great Pit, and were presumably engulfed by it. The next day, Gertrude Robinson and Yen Kilbride, who you'll remember from last episode as the poor astronaut who got harassed by the Fairchild family in space, arrived at Bucota. Gertrude had somehow realized that the ritual could be stopped by throwing a body touched by the vast into the pit at just the right time and, in an apparent act of mercy, took to killing and cutting apart Jan before throwing him in. According to John, it was not merciful. After that, a massive earthquake struck the town, reducing Bucota and everyone into it to a simple memory of the dirt. Much like the vast, there are a lot of domains which could theoretically fit too close I cannot breathe, since they involve enclosed spaces, but I'm instead going to be focusing on only those which carry its themes. The Field of Worms is probably the best example of a buried domain, even though it has some elements of the flesh or even the extinction. In this great field, worms that were once human are forced along thin tunnels, crawling their way up until they reach the surface. Unfortunately for them, the surface is always tantalizingly out of reach, as the worms are pushed back into their holes by a rainstorm each time they make any substantial progress. 
From a fear standpoint, this seems to represent a hopeless struggle against poverty or financial burdens, which fits pretty well with the buried in general. The colony also has elements of the center, with its tight tunnels and swarming hordes, though I'd also argue that millions of ants are just as suited for the corruption. The prison is really hard to pin down to just one fear, but elements of Forever Deep Below creation do appear here in the form of small prison cells and the idea of being entrapped in general. Oh, also, this is going to be a weird one, but you remember the cabin that John and Martin started off the season in? If the cabin did actually become a very small and localized domain post-change, then it sure as hell had elements of the buried, given how it tried to keep our dynamic duo from ever leaving it. Just an idea I had that felt worth sharing. Now it's time to talk about connections, so I'm going to get the obvious one out of the way. You've heard me call back a fair amount to the last Entities Explained episode about the Vast, and that's entirely intentional. In fact, I released these two back to back specifically because of how connected they are. I went into a fair amount of depth about the connections between Choke and Vertigo last time, but in quick summary, the two forces are opposites, in the process defining each other, try imagining a down without an up, but can commingle in certain rare circumstances. Also, the buried is generally representative of monetary struggles, while the vast finds itself in the minds of the wealthy. Honestly, if you want to go more in depth on that connection, I talked about it a lot last time, so you might as well just go watch that one once you're done here. Moving from opposites to similar entities, we'll start with the corruption. Given most insects' affinity for dirt, it's not a surprise that they pair well with the very earthy fears of Breathless, and other invertebrates like worms appear plenty throughout its statements. While not particularly similar in theming, the manifestations of the dark and buried also tend to be quite similar, as the abyssal darkness of caves can make them feel even more constricting. Then, of course, there's the lonely, which is so similar to the center that the statements of each respective power often point out the other's influence. Plenty of Forsaken statements involve things like encircling fog or crushing crowds, while Too Close I Cannot Breathe often focuses on the solitude of being trapped alone during a thunderstorm, or the isolation of the pit's victims. I think the final nail in the coffin, though, is the fact that both powers can be thwarted in one very simple way, anchoring. While it's possible that this could be a way to escape other entities, we've seen it done successfully for the buried and the lonely, which feels pretty significant to me. Oh, and before we move on to the analysis, I have to mention that Forever Deep Below Creation might have an antagonistic relationship with the web, given the incident with the mud-toothed man, but I sort of find that unlikely. From a thematic standpoint, they seem to fit together pretty well since pressure, especially financial pressure, is a great way to motivate and influence. With that, let's finally analyze the buried. Starting off, we have the narrative connection, also known as the time for me to try rubbing my two remaining brain cells together until they come up with an idea that will immediately be surpassed by the comments section. I have a few clues on how this could work, but all of them tie back to the general idea of expectations, so that's what I'm going with. First up, there's the expectations of fans when creating a piece of media, especially as it develops or is given sequels. Fandom is a tricky thing, and to say this in the way least likely to seem like biting the hand that feeds, I think a lot of creatives struggle to please the people who enjoy their work, especially when the bar is high, so it's pretty easy for an external pressure to set over time. The pressure can come from backlash from an oversold promise, or a pattern of previous failures, or it can just be in the mind of an author. It doesn't change things very much. Even perceived expectations can be harmful. Writing this down, I feel like someone made this same argument in the comments of another video, but I can't seem to find it now, so if you're the person who commented about a similar topic, feel free to let me know down below. However, there's more to expectations than that. There's also the pressure that comes from executives and from the self. 
Unlike fans who want to see a product in its greatest form and in the process can often set unrealistic expectations, executives care only about performance. This can bring about pressure to water down or simplify stories so that they can hit a wider target demographic, while in the process costing the work artistically, as the intent of the author has been muddied for such changes to be effective. Internal pressure from the author themselves, though, is often the worst part, because it takes the harshest elements of each. Any creative, or really most people, will tell you that the voice in your head is your greatest critic. The creator is often the first real fan of a work, and wants to see it polished until there isn't a single flaw left, but they're also commonly forced into the mindset of the executive. Contrary to popular belief, artists need to eat, so sometimes stories have to be able to return a profit, and in the back of their mind, that voice is almost always pointing out how it could do more. I think the pressure placed on creatives could definitely have a part here, and I feel like this might be one of my most solid connections yet. Guess that did wind up working out, huh? Oh, and before any of you go talking about how this isn't really a storytelling element, I'd like to point out that this is arguably one of the most important story elements, because it takes a step back and looks at the people behind the stories you love. Behind every piece of media, there's another, greater story about an artist who wanted to make something. Anyways, stepping back in a level for a minute, since we still have to talk about The Buried itself, I'm going back around to the tried and true classic of comparing the falling titan and forever deep below creation this time with a guest appearance from The One Alone. You see, while writing this episode, I realized that The Buried and The Vast both have strong connections to The Lonely, which is a really weird detail for two diametrically opposed forces. The more I think about it, though, the more it makes sense, because regardless of whether you're in a massive empty space or a small empty space, the space is still empty. Choke works on the idea of isolation through separation, keeping you cordoned off from everyone else and trapped in your own, literally, tiny bubble. While Vertigo instead creates isolation through distance, where you can see for miles and yet catch no one. In the vast, there's no one around to hear your screams, and in the buried, all screaming will do is waste your air. Anyways, moving on, I think the buried is also very interesting because of how forgotten it is. There are only two entities left on this list, one of which is at the bottom for theming reasons, and the other of which barely existed by the time the series was over, which leaves Too Close I Cannot Breathe as the least significant of the real powers, and I think that's because we never really got a character for it. I believe Johnny said somewhere that there was meant to be a buried avatar that got scrapped, and I'll be honest, I believe it. Nonetheless, it still has a fairly strong showing in the form of the coffin, which has major plot significance and is one of the first real mysteries of the series that, interestingly, we never get full resolution on. Sure, we know what it is, but we still don't understand it properly. We don't know who made it, although I subscribe to the Hezekiah Wakely theory, and we don't know why it works the way it does. You could say that about most artifacts in the series, and you wouldn't be wrong, but the coffin always felt different to me. One thing I overlooked for much longer than I'd like to admit is that the coffin's alternate name, the Pit, calls back quite strongly to the ritual of the buried. Both pits seem to draw people in, have weird occurrences when combined with the avatars of other powers, and interestingly, are avoided by the protagonists of their given episodes. The phrase, we all ignore the pit, isn't just referencing how Bukota's residents didn't give much thought to the crater in their town, but also to how Joshua Gillespie managed to ignore the call with his block of ice, and maybe, if you want to take a step back again, how the authors ignored the buried, leaving it to eventually collapse on its own. Finally, and this is just a weird detail I noticed, but the buried seems to stick with its victims in the sense that the first encounter often isn't the last, and in many cases, isn't even when the weird stuff happens. The flooding only starts after visiting the offices of Eberhardt and Strauss. The desire to open the coffin doesn't start reaching into your mind until after you've had it for a while. Hezekiah doesn't become aggressive until after he's reported. 
Obviously, this isn't uncommon in horror, since you normally have to establish a threat before it actually becomes frightening. Hell, look at one of the scariest episodes, Mag 86, tucked in for an example of that. But I feel like it happens much more often with the buried, almost as if it's a reactive entity. The buried just softly pushes, applying more and more pressure until eventually the person snaps, and that's when things get serious. Forever Deep Below creation has to work slowly because, like stones being piled on a chest, it has to crush its victims over time and with the most fear possible. Just like that, we are done with this episode of Entities Explained and, by proxy, The Buried. There is less than a month left before this series turns one year old, which makes me feel old. But I am really happy with how this journey has gone so far, and I'm excited to bring you all the final two parts later this year, putting us in a perfect place for the public January release of Protocol. Anyways, as always, be sure to let me know if I missed anything, if you have any theories of your own, if you disagree with my takes, or if you just want to say hi, all of which you can do in the comments down below. Speaking of the comments, I'm still taking submissions for the TMA Hot Takes video, so the pinned comment should include a link you can click on to take you there. Share whatever you like, and I'll be reacting to them hopefully later this month. With all of that out of the way, grab your gas masks and writing ribs, because next time we're covering the future without us. Thank you once again for watching the video. I've been Afton G. Keir, and this has been Entities Explained. Good night, YouTube people.